Ladies and gentlemen, for the next panel, please welcome back to the stage your host and moderator, Mr. John Comcall. Hi everyone, uh, long time no see. I'm still John Komkov. I'm the uh, managing partner of Fathom Capital. It's an early stage venture capital firm based in San Francisco. Um, filling in for uh, another colleague of mine who uh, had a canceled flight, so apologies for a little clunkiness here. But very excited to, uh, to host uh, this next panel on consumer fintech. Um, reinventing a trillion dollar industry. We've got uh, three fantastic founders with us here. Nick Zhu from uh, Wairu, which is enabling smarter shopping, uh, both in uh, mobile and in, uh, you know, in-store context. Um, uh, Di Chao Bei, who's with Viabil, um, and then as well as uh, Jan Lucha, or, or, sorry, Jan Lucha with Viabil and Di Chao Bei with Moneyline. So let's bring those three folks to stage and uh, we can do more extensive intros. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, well, thanks again for coming out here, guys. Uh, I think to begin with, probably makes sense to contextualize what each of you is doing over a minute or two. So, Nick, let's begin with you and maybe tell us a little bit about Wairu. Absolutely. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, at this point, you're probably wondering uh, what is Wairu or even how to pronounce it. Uh, we are essentially a big data company in a, in a retail vertical. What, what I mean by that is basically the whole concept came about a few years ago, as we work with uh, large companies to leverage their data to do predictive modelings, we realized that the balance between access to information between business, big business, and consumers actually getting more and more uh, imbalanced. So we decided to go out and bring the state-of-art machine learning and the data mining capabilities to the other side of the fence to help consumers, to empower you guys to put you back to the driver's seat. So what we did was basically we went out and collected the largest data set for retail content and applied a kind of uh, machine learning and, and, and data mining technology to it to make it really, really efficient for consumers to access the information. So today, as consumers, you, you actually, when you go to a shopping website, what you get access to is pretty much the same as 20 years ago. So we want to really change that. Currently, we have the website, we have a mobile app. We also just released a browser extension, which will literally bring that intelligence to you without any work uh, while you shop uh, yesterday at, at Collision. Uh, as a technologist, I also uh, was really interested to share lessons, experience we learned over the years scaling up. We started with a very humble stack, and today we have a really deep stack with machine learnings, uh, serverless architectures, uh, and uh, servicing multiple platforms and multiple channels. If you're interested, Feel free to connect with me and find me at the conference. I will be more than happy to discuss. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Nick. Um, next up, we have uh, Jan Lucha with Viable uh, out of Denmark. So, Jan, maybe uh, tell us a little bit about Viable. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much for being here, and uh, let me introduce you to Viable. So, just to get you into the mindset of what Viable is really doing please think of PayPal. So Viable is an online payment method integrated in thousands and thousands of web shop, but where PayPal or Visa is merely a transaction moving an amount from A to B, Viable is doing exactly that, but adds a bunch of really neat features on top of that transaction. So um, what we buy most of online is clothes, shoes, and accessories. Um, try to do this small memory test with me. Um, think back of the last time you were in a physical retail shop. You were probably doing like me, shopping jeans or something like that, bringing a ton of uh, jeans to the dressing room, fitting room, and uh, leaving the shop with just one pair or none. Why? Because it didn't fit right. So what do we do when we are shopping online when there is no fitting room? Well, the answer is simple. We need to pay up front for all the pair of jeans that we want to buy, return them, wait 
17 days averagely to get our money back. Now that is a problem, actually, that is the biggest problem of online shopping according to Harvard Business Review. And that is exactly the problem that Viable is solving. So uh, when a consumer checks out with Viable, Viable immediately pays the merchant, but the customer pays nothing. Um, the customer receives the product, bring them home into their own um, comfort of their own home, and try them on and re return what they don't want to keep. 30 days later, Viable automatically refund, um, charges the credit card with that uh, net purchase. So, a few facts about Viable. We're out of Denmark. We're launching in US in, in September. We have 5,000 shops in, uh, in uh, Denmark in the Nordics. And I would love to talk to each and every one of you that want to be part of that journey. We have an ARR of 12 million US dollars and a net profit of three. Thank you so much for listening. Great, thank you, Jan. And uh, finally, we've got uh, D Chabé with uh, Money Lion. Thank you, D. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is D Chabé, co-founder and CEO of Money Lion. Money Lion, uh, I hate to use the word, overly used word, but really democratizing private banking for the American consumer. Today, we're bringing better borrowing, saving, and investing tools to more than two and a half million members here in the United States. But if you really think about at the core of why we exist, in 2009, 2010, the credit crisis really wiped out the ability of the banks to go directly to consumers with consumer-facing products. Today, Moneyline represents the big alternative to the big bank. We bring better borrowing, saving, and investing tools directly to consumers. We're putting the personal financial advisor, as well as the personal banker, into everyone's pocket. And the reason we're able to do that is are the massive advancements in artificial intelligence and big data and machine learning technologies. Because we see data across such a broad universe of consumers, the power of our algorithms to contextualize and personalize an experience directly for uh, the household that's making anywhere from $20,000 to $40,000 to $100,000 a year really brings private banking that was previously reserved for the wealthiest Americans to folks that never had access to uh, algorithmic advice about goals, about uh, financial planning, about when they're going to run out of paycheck. The stark statistics in the United States are that 66 million Americans don't have zero dollars in savings. Today, that consumer is coming to Money Lion to have a better financial life in the sense that they're saving $50 a month through a first-of-its-kind subscription finance product. So happy to be here and uh, happy to talk more about Money Lion afterwards. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dee. Um, you know, now we're going to transition into sort of an open Q&A format. Uh, I've prepared a few, uh, few prompt questions. Maybe to begin with, uh, at least in the U.S. market, uh, consumers seem to be inundated with you know, myriad personal financial services applications. Um, how did you guys decide which opportunity to go after, where to focus your efforts? Uh, maybe Nick, uh, begin with uh, telling the story with Wairu. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that's a big challenge. Um, and for any startup, just finding the right niche, finding the right product to build is, is a huge challenge. So uh, we really, um, nobody really knows uh, when, when, they, when they start. Our recommendation is basically track everything Mm. Track all the data points that you can, you can collect uh, and come up with credible hypothesis and go out with testing uh, methodologies and then just uh, uh, verify it with data. Um, and if you can find traction, if you can find growth uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain area, be nimble and pivot quickly uh, to capitalize that kind of uh, momentum. Excellent. Um, you know, maybe next. Uh you know, some of you, uh, D and Nick, probably have kind of opted for more of a direct-to-consumer D2C route versus, you know, Jan. I would imagine you probably uh, involved merchants with some of your early go-to-market strategies. Uh, you know, clicking down on that, maybe Jan, can you talk a little bit about the trade-offs of different distribution channels and how you thought about kind of the risk-reward of uh, you know choosing your own channel? Yes, I can, John. Thank you very much. So for viability, it's been. Uh it has been really important to, to lean on the trust that has already been built between the consumer and the uh, web shop when shopping. So when a consumer is in a web shop that they have the trust and they see viable that the web shop has chosen to provide, we're naturally um, blue chip there already. So that is quite obvious for us and we have made some really neat uh, price tags integrated in each and every product page of a web shop. 
So uh, the customer sees us right there in the, uh, in the checkout where the need is. Yep. D, maybe, uh, you know, I would imagine Moneyline, maybe there's more of a D to C model. Um, how, how have you sort of thought about that channel and, and kind of building up? Scale. Yeah, look, look, I mean, I think from our perspective, we looked at the consumer need, mm -hmm. um, and we recursively iterated. So we started off as a pure play lending business, and uh, we knew that lending was our ability to get massive amounts of data on behavior, on underwriting. So today we sit on over two and a half million bank accounts linked to our platform. And while we're directly going to consumers to have that conversation. Really, the strategy behind this was how do we build a data moat? So everyone who's building companies today, everyone has artificial intelligence, it's statistics, it's advanced statistics that you know, have, have been around since the 50s. But how do you really build a business that um, builds that type of value? You ultimately have to build that data moat. So our direct-to-consumer strategy was having a conversation with consumers that convinced them in this world that we are providing you so much value. Our first product was a minimum viable product where we said, consumer, uh, link your Facebook account and we'll knock off 50% off the interest rate. Mm, yep. Now, my, all of my 15 lawyers in compliance would tell me the very various reasons why that's not allowed, but just iterating quickly and having that minimum viable product in the market allowed us to have incredible insights from recursively iterating um, with, with, with uh, that strategy in mind. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, shifting gears a little bit, um, the statistic that I found this morning is that total household debt in the United States um, just in the past year rose by more than $190 billion, and the outstanding balance is uh, somewhere north of $13 trillion now. Um, you know, against that sort of staggering backdrop, how do you think about sort of the, the moral implications of building, you know, a financial services platform that's going to touch consumers? Do you think you guys have a responsibility with regard to education, with regard to sort of, you know, financial health and financial management. Nick, any sort of thoughts on this topic? Yeah, this is actually uh, uh, really close to our core mission. Uh, we really believe that uh, the ability to access information is truly, uh, that's the power, right? Uh, consumers so far, uh, you know, e-commerce e and, and the retail, online retail market has uh, progressed significantly in all aspects, but the only area where it hasn't really developed at all uh, since the early, uh, early 90s when, when uh, online retail was introduced was actually access to information. So a simple question like, you know, for a, a budget conscious household, uh, let's say if you, if you see a retailer telling you it's 40% off, does that even have any meaning? 40% off from, from where, from what? If it's 60% off yesterday, it's a horrible discount. Uh, so we, our mission is really to bring innovation and information to retail and to give that transparency to the consumers so they, you will be empowered to make that decision. So you might still decide to buy the same product, but you can make that decision fully informed with all the information that's uh, available uh, on the market. Yep. Dee, I, I would imagine this, uh, this topic probably inter intercepts with uh, Moneyline's mission in a way too. Sure, so our mission is to bring the private bank to the consumers. What does that really mean in layperson terms? 100 million households struggle with finances today. Uh, so everything in our proposition is around both of the assets and the liabilities that consumers have. So it's never about, hey, John, take a loan, take a loan, take a loan. It's always about, hey, John, we think you're going to run out of money in 14 days. And to have those types of insights, you have to have, you have, to have the ability to see data across multiple different consumers across the world. And the technology that we've built is really catering to a segment of the population that's been underserved. So JP, JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs with Marcus are really going after the super prime parts of society. No one is really focusing on the 100 million Americans in the middle of the society. And, and FinTech is really interesting to me today is because we're able to use the advancements in parallel processing and compute power to bring those types of technologies to the consumers who really need it the most. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about product market fit. Um, you know, the holy grail for consumer fintech is to find product market fit using the least amount of capital possible. Um, Jan, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that story with Viabill, how you kept sort of customer acquisition costs low enough to scale far enough as you did to this point. Yeah, it's very interesting. So for Viabill, it has been really crucial to find a very vast distribution um, network and that has been through the web shops I told you just before about our price tag that is integrated everywhere in the web shop. That means that 
the consumers, whatever they are looking at, are meeting viable mm. right when the need is there. So we have been spending a lot of time and effort in understanding which distribution network could we work with that brings us out there really cheap, really vast, and uh, giving us a very low uh, CAC. And uh, keeping, of course, the organization super lean with outsourcing whatever we can, mm -hmm. uh, accounting, et cetera. And um, that, uh, that brings us quite far. Yep. Nick or Dee, any other sort of uh, surprises with regard to finding product market fit? Yeah, I think I, I completely agree with that approach. Uh, I think, and don't get me wrong, it's still very important to make sure your, your core uh, acquisition uh, you know, on, on Facebook, on search engines, uh, when it's, when, you know, especially for us, we're, we're directly facing the consumers, you optimize that uh, as much as possible. However, I think to look at creative distribution partners, uh, channels where uh, uh, perhaps it's under, underutilized by other business in the, in the same in industry, the same segment is uh, crucially important. Yep. Coming up on uh, two minutes with limited time left, uh, you know, fintech, financial services more generally, one of, if not the most uh, regulated industries out there. Um, you know, part of being a successful entrepreneur is moving fast and breaking things at times. How do you sort of re resolve those two factors? Uh, D, you know, you doing a bank uh, in some respects is sure. a heavily regulated space, so I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. Yeah, sure, so today we have uh, 15 people in compliance. When we started the company, we had uh, me and my two co-founders. Uh, so today we're regulated at the state, federal, local level. Um, but really what I would emphasize is that even in fintech and regulated industries, you have to have the MVP mindset. So that story that I was telling, our first product was we got a license in the state of Utah and we put personal money out to, lo to loan money on a website. And um, you have to have the mentality that you have to understand what the customer wants. And you have to, we made probably a million mistakes and through those mistakes we got insights each time. And we got product market fit only after we really spoke to consumers about what real need we were solving. We understood that we had something when we knew that our customers were desperate for the product. They couldn't live without it. There was no other solution. And unfortunately, that happened to be only 3% of the overall segment of the, popula of the customers that we were targeting. But once we figured that out, the infrastructure, the compliance, the technology, there's a whole industry of folks out there that will come to you once you figured that um, perspective of who's desperate for your product. Excellent. Um, well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but um, I myself have learned a lot from this panel. So thank you, Nick, Jan, and Dee, uh, for, for sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.